earlier on, we've seen Turn the Tide on Plastic come across the line ahead of them, a full 24 hours ahead of them, taking fourth place, and that is confirmed Dongfeng Race Team as our current overall race leader. Now, Mafre just have to finish behind them to collect the points on offer. I've got Conrad Coleman with me here. Conrad, what's the latest, the breeze, and what can we expect? Well, as you can see in this image here, it is an absolute drift off as we have seen all the way through the arrivals here in Itajai. The way that we've been seeing this, or the reason that we've been seeing this, is that there's always a conflict between uh, the, the general winds, so the synoptic winds, and that's sort of been driving the boat to the line, but then once they get within range of the land, and you can see just to the right-hand side of the bowsprit, uh, of Mafre there, the line of lights that represents Itajai and the safe haven that is waiting just, well, I was going to say just miles away and just minutes away, but they've just had a massive header and we're going to have to see what happens. So this is that transition that we've seen uh, conflict all of the boats right at this moment, is that we've got uh, land breeze, particularly at night, that is fighting a generally sort of offshore or southerly breeze. Um, and, uh, and that, that leads to this, this sort of corridor of nothingness that we've seen all of the boats get stuck in for now. Well, currently at the moment, we know that Mafre are struggling with three knots of wind speed. And from the shots that we can see at the moment, the crew, they do look a little bit tired. All the teams at the moment are looking forward to putting leg seven firmly behind them. Mafre is the only boat still racing on this leg at the moment. And, uh, on the right hand side we've got in the black Xabi Fernandez, skipper of Mafre, not on the helm because that's not the position that he normally takes. I mean, Shabby in this regard, he's quite unique among the skippers. He is, absolutely. That um, he is somebody who who spent a long time in Olympic preparation, and uh, most notably with um, Ika Mantinas, who in the last edition of, of the race was the skipper of, of Mafre, for, for most of it at least. And um, I, I think that this, this represents um, just the, the comfort zone of, of Xabi Fernandez, that he is there to drive performance, he's there to empower and to amplify everybody else on board that boat. And I think that he sort of, <clears throat> he leads from behind or from the middle because he's, he's typically the pit man on board, which puts him right in the middle of the boat. That means that he can be uh, the one that's dictating the rhythm of maneuvers and, and um, being the link between the front of the boat and the back of the boat. And he's right there in the middle in the key position. Now, I just want to bring up a couple of things that we can see from this image. We've known over the last few days that Mafre have been running low on certain supplies. This leg uh, has been long for them uh, compared to the other teams. But if you look at the back of the boat, I'm seeing uh, a little bit of coolant wash coming out there. There was a question about how much fuel they had on board, but right now the engine's running. Now, if you're not used to what we can see on the Volvo 65s, you're not used to the Volvo Ocean Race and ocean racing in general, you might go, the engine's running? Are they cheating? Talk us through it. <laughs> no, not at all. And the reason that I can say that is because their speed is just fractionally, uh, well, it's, it's nothing at the moment. And so if they were cheating, they would be cheating in a much more dramatic fashion. So the, the engine is engaged, but that's to charge the batteries, that's to be able to uh, provide the hydraulic power required for swinging the keel backs and forwards, and they've got um, lots of maneuvers to do, even as they drift to a halt, because they need to uh, often drop the keel down, sometimes to lured to try and get uh, heel on the boat to so get that big masthead code zero to sort of fall into place. So the engine's running, but the propeller is not turning. Well, at the moment, Mafre in the darkness, lit up by the camera boats and the spectator fleet is looking rather good, but there's what we wanted to see. This has been the big news story for Mafre of the last few days. This repair that you are seeing, that strip of material joining the top and the bottom of the sail back together. This has been what has caused so many problems for this team. A breakage and a serious moment for the team to try and work through. The, boat, the shore team was waiting for them and they had a couple of very tenacious few hours to fix the boat. 
and it went well. I mean, as you can see, Mafre are back out in the water. You could see that strip through, and it was very lucky that the shore crew were there, not only with the shore team there, but also our OBR on board Mafre was able to capture that 13 hours and just how much work was putting into getting Mafre back up to racing speed. Efectivamente, tenemos muy poco tiempo, pero por suerte tenemos una gran infraestructura, hemos conseguido un gran barco para estar aquí. Pensábamos que no ibais a parar, al final habéis parado, pero tenemos todo muy bien, muy bien preparado y yo creo que va a ser muy efectivo nuestro tiempo. Tenemos tres frentes abiertos, uno es el palo, otro es la mayor y otro es la botavara. Esto es prácticamente un detalle, lo gordo es eh, la, la vela mayor. Yo creo que 12 horas están para mucho. Bueno, la noche simplemente la tendremos que ignorar, digamos, tendremos que trabajar con luces y, digamos, seguir trabajando y... In one sense, we, we've been lucky just break it close by and be able to, to get on shore quite quick and, and repair it now here with the short team. So we have Nerio, the boat builder, now up the rig, preparing the, the mast to, to, to do the track we have ready downstairs. Uh, this is one of the biggest jobs, but I'm not more concerned about the main set because we broke the mesa from left to reach all the way, so it's in two pieces. So it's quite tricky repair uh, to be done with the material stuff, the material we have here and, all, uh, and the place we have to do it. Also, the battery is not helping a lot because it's quite cold, so it, for the route to, to cure is very hard. But we want to do all, all what we can, all, all what is in our hands to do it, and try to finish the leg. La verdad es que va bastante bien, es como siempre un poco más lento de lo que nos gustaría, pero en el mástil lo hemos pegado ya, el carro, y estamos terminando con la mayor. Por lo cual, bueno, esperamos salir en una hora y media de aquí, hacia el punto de suspensión, lo cual nos daría para llegar en exactamente las 12 horas que hemos calculado perder. Y bueno, luego no es tan sencillo porque bueno, pues la reparación de la mayor tiene que secar mejor y bueno, pues empezaremos a navegar rumbo a Brasil. No, no a, a tope de prestaciones, pero bueno, pues eh, avanzando lo máximo posible y perdiendo lo menos el menor tiempo posible. So a tough 13 hours for Mafre, but good preparation and good planning to have the shore crew waiting for them in Ushuaia. It was very interesting talking to the crew around about that moment to hear how, how forthright they were, knowing that if you get into a problem, that's where you want your shore team. Uh, so a lot of people are saying, well, that was lucky. No, it was good planning, but a lot of technical work going on in that repair and a little bit of, um, well, a little bit of inventiveness to find the material as well. Well, well, yes, very definitely. You know, I, I spoke with Neil McDonald um, about this moment, and he said that this plan had been put into place a full 12 months before today. And so this was absolutely uh, not good luck, but good management, and uh, really, really impressive. Now, because of the rules required, um, you cannot add more materials. So you can have uh, manpower, but you can't actually bring in more materials uh, to fix the boat than they had already on board. So that means that they were very, very limited with the, um, with the sail repair kit that they had on board, and so actually they had to sacrifice one of the sails on board. We, we think it's the big A3, because that's the sail that we haven't seen them sail with, and that's the sail that is not branded. So we've, <clears throat> we see that big sort of yellow, pale, creamy strip going across the mainsail, uh, and, and that has come out of the sail that has not been branded, so that's the A3. So our thought is that they chop that, um, chop that up into, a, into that sort of zigzag Zorro pattern across the mainsail 
and glued it down with, um, with Sigaflex or 3M 5200, depending on, on what they had on board. Um, and that is such an impressive repair. And, and also, uh, they balanced that really nicely in the sense that they did the repair and then they folded the sail up, carefully put it inside the boat, they let the glue cure uh, for 24 hours inside the boat, and so they were sailing initially not bareheaded, but um, without, the, without the mainsail, so just on the foresails to, to finally round Cape Horn. And so that was an investment of time, uh, but really wise decision making that shows that this team has such incredible experience. And I, th I think also important to note that Xabi Fernandez, as we saw in that clip, at the beginning of that clip, the main split, there's that moment, he lets out a cry of frustration. That's the most emotion that I've seen from Xabi Fernandez. As a leader in a situation like this, I can't really think of anybody better. Uh, no, I, I completely agree with you. That this is a, a team that stays. Um, well, we, we, we hear this a lot from from Charlie Enright. He talks more about it, but uh, but Shabi really em embodies this in terms of sort of keeping a really even keel, not celebrating the highs, not getting hung up in the lows, just keeping a really um, stable environment on board. And so, because even. Uh, during the course of this leg where they've had so many ups and downs, but even in the course of one day or one watch, you can have so many ups and downs. That it, just frankly, in terms of offshore racing, it's exhausting if you start celebrating and mourning each individual moment. And so the, um, the proof of a mature team that's ready to perform over the long term is one that can keep their heads and their wits together. And I think it's important to point out, as you can see from the heli shots here and from the ribs that are chasing the boat, as we were looking up earlier, this is a good repair. I mean, the, the shape of the sail, you would have thought that it would be difficult to put it back together to get any kind of efficient aerodynamic shape. I mean, by my eye, that doesn't look bad. Frankly, I'm astonished. I'm, the, the, just mechanically that they were able to keep this together in one piece. Uh, I've been working as a sailmaker for North Sails, and in the previous edition of the race, I actually built some of the sails that went on board the boats, um, working in the North Sails loft in Vannes in France. And so I, I know a little bit about these products and it is amazing that they're able to get a luft to leech rip uh, all the way across the sail and then down in the southern ocean at 55 degrees south uh, when it's cold and wet and salty, we're able to get a repair that, uh, that is held together. I am astonished. Heads off. Now this is the shots from the heli at the moment, all the Volvo Ocean 65s. One design, but there are s small little areas that they can tweak. And it's interesting when we get a chance to see the close-up shots of the deck, those little nets that they've added to the back. Safety, but also just able to uh, not run the risk of sails of pushing uh, further towards the back of the boat in, in some of the wavy conditions. But the big masthead code zero up, the sails starting to look a little bit tired. Towards the leech I'm looking there, you're getting a little bit of a curl there, and we can forgive the sails for doing that. Furling sail, halfway around the world now, it's, it's gonna look a little bit you know, up against it. Uh, yeah, that's right, the leech is starting to hook there a little bit, and so um, that could be a consequence of the fact that they've put on the, uh, on the leech line quite heavily because the sail is uh, starting to fatigue, and so you end up sort of transferring the, the load from one, one part of the sail to another. Um, but remember, these boats in this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race do have two complete sets of sails that they're able to pick and choose between. However, the moment is absolutely critical about when they do that, because once you go from set uh, from masthead code zero A to masthead code zero B, you can't go back. So if you rip one in half after you've made that change, then you're really in trouble. Uh, so it's, it's all about planning and also logistically. Remember that there are containers that go all around the world that carry these sails and you need to pick and choose very carefully and put that plan into place long in advance. Well, we've got a nice view at the moment of the back of the boat and uh, just on the back left-hand side, the hydro generator. This is something that's been on board the boat all the way since the beginning. It's a new piece of technology to generate power from the boat moving forward, but we've seen Mafre using it on this leg and using it because they needed to. Well, yeah, it's, it's new in the Volvo Ocean Race. This is the first time that they've had them. Previously, as backup power units, they've had uh, sort of small wind turbines. Um, but actually, in the, the French style of racing, in the French community, and it's, it's, a, it's a company called Watt & Sea, which is um, a small company down in, uh, down in La Rochelle, 
in, um, <coughs> in France. Um, it's relatively well developed, and so it's a unit that pivots down into the water um, and is a, kind of like a small propeller that works in reverse. And so it drops down into the water, and then as the flow of the water uh, from the boat moving, uh, moving forwards goes around it, it spins a turbine. So basically, if you can imagine a, a dam, a hydroelectric dam that creates uh, electricity that has a fixed turbine with water rushing through it, this is kind of the, the same principle but in reverse. And actually, I've used the same unit for the, my last three races around the world, uh, and uh, that was absolutely key to, to the idea of, of, um, of boats using 100% renewable energy uh, that the reality that you can produce unlimited amount of power as the boat is moving forward um, is now absolutely changing the era of ocean racing. Well, we've got a great shot of the crew there, and I, and I just want to highlight one or two key players. Mafre is a squad that I think you can't really take one person out. They don't want to because we know they haven't made any big crew changes. But I'm seeing number seven, Antonio okay. Cuvus Mons. In all of the boat feed videos that we've seen, anything that they've had with their uh, boat trouble and the rest of it, he's been somebody that's been really, really there all the way. This is a team that has been out on the water pushing incredibly hard, driving very well and setting the standards for all the other teams to follow. But certainly at this point in the race, with them coming in in this position, you can ask yourself a little bit of that question is, has that time run its course? Has the other boats kind of kept up? And now, just because they've been able to hold their fingernails on, they realize, yeah, we can, we can just pip you. Dong Fong's done it, Team Brunel's done it, Team Axe and done it, Turn the Tide on Plastic's done it. Yeah, it's gonna be really interesting to see what happens now in this race because, uh, as you quite rightly say, this team has just lost the overall leadership by one point, so that means that we're completely tied up now essentially after, um, after seven legs at sea. But some people have suggested online that, um, that this is an, a sort of unlucky leg and that um, the, the team had problems with their mast track and then their mainsail ripped in half and it comes down to luck and, or, or bad luck, the fact that they've lost the lead. And while you might, you might be able to say that, it looks like the team's uh, setting up for, for attack here, um, uh, yes, there we go. We've, we've got, um, got the shot there on the water, and so they've just blown uh, the sheet and thus the, the clue of the uh, big masthead, main, uh, masthead uh, code zero. They need to wait before turning. There we go. There's the turn. Uh, to furl the sail and get that clue up towards the front of the boat as the sail furls around the forestay, and then it's only then that um, Pablo Arati, who's, who's typically the, the helmsman on when... Uh, when seconds count um, on the helm, spins the boat, and then you can deploy or unfurl that, um, that masthead code zero, and then sheet in on the other side. As we saw last time with Turn the Tide on Plastic, uh, this is a tricky maneuver to keep the boat running in these light conditions, but this, remember, this is a team that's been stuck in a high pressure zone for days now, and so they have certainly had plenty of time to practice these uh, light winds or down speed uh, attacks and jibes, particularly with this big sail. But one of the things that I wanted to talk about a little bit more is, um, is just the fact that ocean racing is completely unique in the pantheon of sport. That uh, if you've got a technical problem, if you, if you pop a ball when you're playing football, well, you get a new one on the, on the pitch immediately. Uh, if, you, if you get a flat tire in Formula One, well, you go into the pits and your team comes along and, uh, and replaces it, and away you go. Or if the engine blows up, then, well, too bad, you'll come back next week and you have another go. One of the things that is totally unique about ocean racing is the fact that it is, it is the world's longest endurance sport. These guys are out there for 45,000 miles or nearly 83,000 kilometers in their passage all the way around the world, and they have to maintain the boat. As soon as the shore crew gives it to them and they start the leg, their mechanical... Um, future really is, is in their hands. They have to take responsibility of that and they have to look after the boat. And so we have seen such an incredible uh, effort by this team and by others to maintain their boats and, and to be um, constantly there with the tools and, and the glue and, the, uh, and coming up with inventive solutions like cutting one sail apart to, to fix the mainsail. And so this is one of the things that 
uh, that I find really beautiful about this board is that it goes over and above just uh, just strategy, just navigation, just teamwork, just biceps, and um, <laughs> it, you know you have to be completely all around it. And and it, you know, yes. Uh, it, it's a shame that they lost uh, this leg, that they lost the overall points because of a mechanical problem, but that's frankly, that's ocean racing. We've seen this time and time and time again since this race first was born in 1973. We've had strong teams, strong leaders who, who have had masts fall down or sails rip in half. That's just life, you know, it's not unfair. This is just proof of the fact that these sailors are unsupported and out in the wildest conditions that the earth can find. And that's what makes this race beautiful. And right now, finally, at the last few half mile maybe, the breeze has arrived. The boat is now doing a good eight, nine, at times 10 knots towards the finish line. We can see the crew on board, Sophie Cizik, the uh, former Team SCA bow crew, now on board Mafre. Blair Took on the left-hand side, the America's Cup and Olympic legend. And then Juan Villa in the middle, the number two, the brains of the boat. And it's interesting, whenever we look at the boat feeds, whenever we dial into the boat, it seems like Juan Villa comes up, tells the crew what's going on, what they need to do, goes down. There isn't much discussion. The respect that this guy seems to command is quite, quite phenomenal. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one thing that's, <clears throat> uh, that's noted about uh, about boats in general, but certainly offshore um, offshore racing boats, uh, is that it is not a democracy. <laughs> uh, that uh, everybody should and uh, and can have their input uh, when when it's welcomed by the by the skipper and the navigator. Um, but typically, it, it's it's Juan who has such incredible stature, such incredible respect in this. Um, um, in this area of offshore racing, that you know he has won the America's Cup. He has um, won, you know, maxi races all around the world. Uh, if he is analysing the, the weather and is coming up with a strategy, then you, you pretty much go for it. Um, although, don't forget, they have made errors before. You know, remember in the leg from Hong Kong to New Zealand, uh, Mafre and and Dongfeng race team got too close to to a high pressure zone, to a ridge, and uh, and fell at the back. Thankfully, they did it together. Um, but, uh, but nobody is immune uh, to getting things a little bit wrong, particularly when Mother Nature is in the equation. Well, just getting in between the boat and the heli a moment ago was, I think, the Soto 40. Uh, it's the local Idijai team, and it's been out there welcoming all the boats in. I, I just want to take a minute here while we're waiting for Mafre to come across the line, just, just to make sure everyone understands this is the last of the boats racing on this leg. But there are two boats that are in a very different race, but arguably even more important. Vestas 11th Hour Racing is racing back to Irijai to rejoin the competition, along with Sun Hunkai Scallywag, the delivery crew on board. They're sailing down through the Straits of Magellan and then coming up to Irijai. We'll talk more about those teams in a moment. We want to stay with Mafre right now because we are moments away. And just looking at some of the comments that you are sending in as you're watching it here along with us in Race Control. Nikki Jansen has written, I have a lot of respect for the MacGyvers on board. You guys have been so well prepared. I think we very much share that sentiment as well. It's important to point out that in the Volvo Ocean Race, in ocean racing, the rules are there. You can suspend racing. You can make the prepares to keep going because we want the boats to stay in the fight. And Shabby Fernandez, number 10, the skipper, has certainly laid out a very good groundwork here. Kept the boat going, kept his crew going. And I think, Conrad, one other thing that really makes them remarkable, we've mentioned this before, but one, by my mind, I mean, tell me, you know, those of you watching at home, tell me if I'm wrong here, but one crew change since the race started, and you compare that with the other boats, I mean, I think on one leg, we had 19 crew changes around the fleet. That shows quite a bit of confidence. It shows an incredible uh, degree of confidence, and that can go two ways. One is the sense that, um, that the team is getting sort of ground down and getting fatigued as, as the stress and the strain of the legs accumulates, but it also means that the team is getting stronger and bonding together. It gets to the point that this team has done uh, hundreds, thousands of maneuvers, tacks and jibes and stacks, and they will be working as a, well, you know, it's terrible to say, a well-oiled machine um, in the sense that 
uh, when it comes to doing a tack, then maybe you sort of reach behind your hand and you can pass a winch handle from one crew member to the other, even without looking, because you know exactly what um, what the next person needs in the in the chain of, of that event. And so, it's it's really really impressive. This is as you as you quite rightly say, the team that has had the least number uh, of crew changes, and it's the t and it's the team that's really been the um, been the most consistent all the way through. And so I think that those two elements can, um, can be can be linked. However. To be able to do that, it means that you need to be in absolutely top physical form uh, at the start of the race. And so clearly um, they, they were very selective with the people that they took on board. They put them through hell in the gym before the start of the race to get them into top performance here. Um, so that you don't actually need that downtime. But also just one thing be uh, before I pass back to you. Let's talk about the fact that Xavi Fernandez, he's got number 10 on the back of his, uh, the back of his Valweli gear. That, for me, just embodies the spirit on board this, uh, on board this boat. You know, we've got the, a crew member, a, a leader, uh, who, who leads from, from within and doesn't need to have number one on the back of a shirt. My, my, the interesting thing on that was, I'd be interested to see, I cannot remember Sophie Cizik, who's the, the bow crew, or certainly that's where we see a lot of her. I wonder whether she's number one. How have they done these numbers? Because as you say, it's certainly not in, in rank of superiority. Uh, if you're watching the images along with us, have a little bit of a look around and see if you can work out why it is that certain people are wearing certain numbers. Xabi Fernandez, as Conrad says, in the number 10 with the gray and black as the skipper, normally in the middle of the boat. Blair Took, not wearing a number at all. Arguably the kit that he's been using for the last few days yeah. is certainly getting a little bit worn, a little bit dirty, but they are now just a few moments away from the line and then ahead of that they are going to be seeing the warm welcome of friends and family, the relief of a meal and the joy of a hot bath, I'm very sure. Well, they're going to be tacking any minute now and we are getting very near to the line indeed. The spectators are out there on the water, the camera ribs there, the helicopters following them. That is the position of the finish line. One more tack to go. That's right. And, um, well, um, it's, it's tricky because now they've got uh, lots and lots of boats around. I can see the, the, the team preparing for that tack right now as, as they load up the winches and just, just do their final checks to make sure that they don't fluff this tack. Um, oh. That would be embarrassing. If the, if the, Why if did you have to jinx it, Conrad? <laughs> Why did you have to jinx it? There no, is no. one more tack to go. There is one more tack. And, and there now, they go. And now it, it starts. The masthead code zero yeah. filling up. All the power going through those pumps. 7,600 nautical miles completed. 21 days of sea all the way through the Southern Ocean. The physical toil, the emotional drain of what all these sailors have been through. One more tack required, but still it has to be done with precision, effort, and timing. The masthead zero comes out, the speed starts to come back on, and the finish line is now just a few boat lengths away. Mafre will cross the line to finish in fifth place. They started this leg in Auckland as overall race leaders. They finished this leg second place, but just one point behind the new race leaders, Dong Fong race team, and with four legs to go, one of them being double points, we are set for a great race all the way down to that final finish line. Well, big relief here, Conrad, that the breeze has actually arrived. We're worried that it was gonna be a drift all the way in. Uh, well, well, yes, we've seen it on the other boats, and um, <clears throat> there, there's always been that, that sort of light corridor, but it is always built just before the line, and, and frankly, it's just for the photos, you know? It's, it's always nice to see a boat fully powered up when it crosses the, crosses the line. It makes it look more triumphant, and you can definitely see that there. The, we can see the sailors patting each other on the back, uh, thumbs up all rounds, and this is a well-deserved celebration. A celebration for coming through all the adversity and for sticking together as a crew through some of the hardest moments that we've certainly seen in Volvo Ocean Race history. But the celebrations are muted, arguably out of respect for what the entire fleet, what the sailing world has been through with the loss of John Fisher. And also as a team, from a performance point of view, they know that this result has hurt their chances. They had five points as an advantage going into this leg. They're now trailing by one. 
And I wonder whether the crew of Mafre, with them sailing so well all the way through this race, whether they ever conceived that after this double points leg, well, we're, we're back to the beginning. Uh, well, yes, but I'd just like to point to the fact that in the interview that I did with Blair Took just a couple of days ago, uh, I was, was frankly floored by the attitude and the resiliency that they demonstrated all the way to, uh, to the line. That I knew that they were running out of food. I knew that they had lost their overall leadership position. Uh, I knew that they had you know, concerns about nursing that, that repaired mainsail all the way across, uh, across the finish line. Uh, but this is a team that has never, ever wavered in their demonstration to, to each other, to their investments in each other, and, and to the fact that they are here for the long term and that they back each other and their team all the way. So as they have now the, the pats on the back and the, and the final celebrations for crossing that line, we could never ever suggest that this is a team that is down, that this is a team that is broken. I think more than ever, they are hungry, they're ready to get back into the fight. And Charles Codrolier, wherever he is in the world right now, I'm sure that he's relaxing and getting ready for the next leg. But this is a team that has got a big target on his back. Well, celebrations on board. Respect for one another because in certainly in the moments that we have seen on leg seven for all the teams, there have been those times where you are relying on your fellow crew members and those on Mafre like every other, have been there helping each other through some of the uh, darkest moments out there on the water, some of those trying times. Now they come across the line, there's still plenty of race ahead of them, but leg seven for Mafre has been an unbelievable test. And as the boat crosses the finish line, they come through proudly, rightly so, of the hard work and the accomplishment that this moment brings. <laughs> Just gone around East Cape early on in the night. And, um, we sort of yeah, made a couple more mistakes and dropped back almost into last. One of our attacks last night, that was me um, to Lord. We're just trying to get the sail on the stack. I thought there was someone on the front, um, but there wasn't. As I pushed it, the after the sail out, the front went into the water. Well, to lose that sail at this stage of the race would have been quite a big deal. This, this evening has been quite exciting because we passed through the river uh, to Vestas. It's quite amazing that after four or five days sailing in the ocean, we are three boats uh, fighting in one mile. So that shows how, how equal the boats are, how, how equal the fleet is. As expected, um, wind's building now into 35 to 40 knots. It's pretty solid, basically. Um, right on the limit. Yeah, when you're on the main, uh, holding the main sheet, obviously it's always wet, so the, the water's going through your gloves and making your hands absolutely freezing. They get basically painful. <laughs> Biggest jobs, but I'm more, more concerned about the main set because we broke the main from left to reach. No, good, now we have to be conservative at the beginning, see how it's working with the loads on the main set. Looking good, hopefully, we can finish with the main set in one piece. Forty minutes each. I guess it depends how thirsty you are. Quite a good shoulder workout. And we can now talk to the skipper of Mafre. Shabby Fernandez is there joining us. Shabby, welcome to the finish line. Welcome to Irijaye. It's been a very difficult leg emotionally, physically, and a tough leg for you and your team. Well, thank you very much, as you said, for all of us, of course, uh, particularly uh, for us in the team, you know, we were expecting much better, uh, 
Finn and the other, we ended up uh, not finishing very well, but uh, well, let's say it's not the end of the world, so not too bad. And we've been really moved here seeing how well this team has held together. You haven't made many crew changes at all. You must have an awful lot of trust in the crew mm. that you have now. Yeah, of course, um, and it's going to keep going like this. Uh, uh, I think uh, we've been uh, highly compromised in this leg uh, because uh, some problems we had, technical problems, and uh, it's nothing to see with the crew work or, or the trust I could have with the, with all the crew. So this is not going to change, and you know we've been going very well till this moment, and I'm pretty sure we keep going good as well. So it's, it's not a matter of changing people; it's just a matter of you know probably sailing a little bit better in the future. At this point in the race. You're no longer the race leader, but still very much the favourites in Spain. We have a lot of Spanish fans watching at the moment. Do you have anything you want to say to them? In Spanish? Please. Yes. Bueno, nada, acabamos de terminar esta larguísima etapa y dura para nosotros en Italia. Y bueno, pues una etapa en la que hemos estado un poco siempre eh, bueno pues condicionados con, con una altura que tuvimos la primera semana y, y bueno pues que el resultado creo que no refleja un poco dónde estamos y espero que, que a partir de la siguiente etapa volvamos a estar arriba eh, vamos a tener una pelea si cabe aún más dura con con Fen sobre todo que se ha puesto líder y bueno pues eh, nada nosotros solo decir que que ahora descansar y lo seguiremos dando todo para intentar ganar esta regata Xavi Fernández thank you very much we'll see you on the dock well done See you later. Xavi Fernandez, skipper of Mafre. Happy, but not elated. I mean, this leg has been a poignant moment for everybody that's finished. Celebrations muted with everything that the sailors have been through. And on a performance level as well, we now face the fact that the race has almost restarted. Dongfeng race team are now our overall race leaders. Mafre in second, only by one point, and Team Brunel have come back up into third place. Now the boat are going to make their way up the river and then to the dock where we're going to be hearing more from the sailors and for the crew just before they get themselves off into the team bases and a chance to rest and reflect from everything they've been through. We're going to be back in a few minutes to hear from the sailors when they hit the dock. We'll see you then. Hello from Race Control in Alicante. If you were watching earlier on, you'll know that Mafre has now finished leg seven, crossing the line to take fifth in this unbelievable leg with everything that we've witnessed out on the water in the Southern Ocean. And in just a few moments, we're going to be able to see the boat reaching the dock, being reunited with everybody on the shore and then hearing from the sailors themselves. But before we do that, let's take a look at what this finish means for the scoreboard because on the start of this leg, it was Mafre that was leading. Now, it's Dongfeng Race Team. It's Dongfeng Race Team by one point. And so as we've been saying, it's almost as if the race now six months from our start in Alicante uh, on the 22nd of October uh, has restarted. So they've gone two thirds of the way around the world and they're back at, uh, back at square one. So we've seen the big movers here have been Team Brunel going from sixth to third place overall, but then the one at the top is the one that's, uh, that's been capturing all of the headlines is Mafre slipping from first to second by just one point. And there's a lot of points still to come in. We know that, the four, point, four legs left to go, one of them being double points. But I, I want to talk a little bit, just while we're waiting for Mafre to come in, I want to talk a little bit about this overall elapsed time, something that was close between Dongfeng race team and Mafre, the point for the lowest elapsed time by the time the race comes to a close. Whereas now, with this finish, I mean, by my calculations here, it's 94 days thereabout for Dongfeng race team, and it's 99 days five days later for Mafre, it might come down to a single point. And do you conceive of a moment where Mafre might be able to get five days deficit back? Well, as you said, we've got four legs coming up. They're all relatively short. This was the queen stage of this edition of the Volvo Ocean Race. Uh, and so to get the kind of time difference to, to make that up is going to be very, very unlikely. And I think that when we spoke to um, 
I spoke to Shabi early on, uh, earlier on in this league after they had that breakage. They said that point is no longer in contention, that they've essentially ceded that one and they're going to have to go points chasing elsewhere. Well, by the look of things, they are just a few moments away from hitting the dock and the boat. Leaning over to the side, the keel is canted, so I'm guessing the water just a little bit shallow in the harbour at the moment on the tide. But the fenders are out and the lines are getting ready to be thrown. Brazilian flags flying. And that boat, I mean, through everything that the sailors have been through, but also the equipment as well, as they came through the line, we were talking about the repairs and the relentless punishment that the conditions have given the, the boat. It still looks pretty good, certainly the hull. Quite shiny and new at the moment. There's the shore crew waiting for them. Some members of the shore crew were there in a Ushuaia to lend them hands when they needed it, when the main split. Now in Idijai, it is the turn for everybody to come together and waiting for them on shore. Of course, four other teams as well will be somewhere there. Maybe they're resting at the moment because we know it is uh, hours wise, very early in the morning. That's got to play on your mind. Your competitors now are getting the rest that you so sorely need. That's right, we can see Dongfeng race team there with their reflective logo now towering over the big logo of Mafre. You can see this is uh, emblematic of the, of the change in the race. You've had Dongfeng race team on land now for more than five days, uh, resting up and getting ready for the next leg. However, when it comes down to the main sail that they so carefully put together to get them to this point, I really hope that that sadly kind of gets chopped up and gets shared between the team because that is the, the kind of beautiful memento it could be um, I think that they, they should all turn them into, into backpacks that, that this team will carry with them for the rest of their lives. Anyway, that's a free suggestion, uh, Shabby Fernandez, you can do with that what you will but uh, that's what I would do. And it's got to be a bit of an anonymous site isn't it when you're coming in here you know what this result has meant for the overall scoreboards and there you can see Dongfeng race team out of the water and as far as we know pretty much ready to go for the next leg that is what five days do for you you are that far behind the rest of the teams however a smile for Xabi Fernandez skipper finally now a chance to shake the hands of those that have helped the team on shore getting through the worst of the conditions and through all the challenges that they face and in just a few moments, we're going to be able to hear from Xabi Fernandez as skipper. The uh, jury team just jumping on board, congratulating the team and carrying out their checks. <laughs> there you go, you've got Bruno Dubois, who's the, uh, the team manager of Dong Fong Race Team. And it's really, uh, it's, it's an obligation, really, for, for teams to, um, uh, to, to greet each other and certainly uh, given the, the, sort of, uh, the, the events that we've seen over the past couple of days with Dongfeng Racing taking the lead, I think it's a really class act that you've got the team manager of Dongfeng there to welcome them in and say, well done, buddy. And we know that this is a competition and, and we do like to talk about the points. Uh, and maybe we don't bring up the, the, the human achievement often enough. We do know that Xabi Fernandez and Charles Cordrelia are friends. That's what competing against each other does. The respect is very much there. Uh, it is, absolutely. And this is a, oh, uh, we, here we've got the opportunity to hear directly from Xavi Fernandez as to what the leg was like. Xavi, what a leg. It must be an incredible relief to finally be here. What was the, the toughest part of the leg? You that it's experienced, you've been there before. What was different this time? Well, Things didn't go very well for us this time. I think uh, since uh, pretty early in the leg, uh, we had a few issues. And then uh, I think, we, well, I don't know. If, now we have to see if we manage them well or not. But, uh, you know, we got all the way to the horn and then uh, things got even worse. And then it's been pretty painful from there. Bom, ele falou que foi uma perna muito difícil, que não foi muito bem para eles. E que lá no, no horn realmente estava complicado, mas que está feliz de estar tá aqui. How hard was for you as a skipper to suspend the race? And what, what were your plans to try to catch up after suspending it? Well, it was hard and the plan was not to stop. But of course, the main uh, broke into pieces, we had to. And then uh, once we stopped, we knew it would be very, very hard to catch up. You always keep the hope, but uh, of course, then uh, we were trapped in this high pressure and there was no way. So, you know, the last four or five days has been painful, but, uh, you know, we try 
to sleep as much as possible and now we rested. Bom, eu perguntei para ele porque eles suspenderam a regata, então é, que é muito difícil uma decisão para o comandante suspender, ele disse que realmente foi complicado, é, que tentaram descansar, que eles iam tentar né, pegar, é, compensar o que perderam, mas que foi uma perna com muito vento, muito difícil deles conseguirem pegar a liderança. E agora você sabe que Dong Fang, você está lutando por o overall lead, e agora eles they got the leadership from you and what you plan to do to get it back well i think it's only one way it's just sail better than them so it's uh, pretty hard uh, they they did a very good leg obviously and you know now we have to rest and still very close in the in the leaderboard and we have to you know rest get ready and do a good leg next one OK, thank you. Eu disse para ele que o Dong Fang virou o líder, né? eles estavam lutando pela liderança, então ele falou que a única forma de pegar a liderança de volta é, claro, velejar melhor que os caras, os caras velejaram muito bem. E é isso aí, senhoras e senhores, Xabi Fernandes, skipper do Mafre. Agora vamos falar com o Johan Vila. Johan, bem-vindo a Itajaí. Uh, tu has estado nos mares do sul outras vezes, ¿Cómo compararías esta vez con las demás? Bueno, esta vez ha sido bastante, bastante duro, ha habido bastante viento y bueno, yo no recuerdo tener tanto viento durante tanto tiempo seguido comparado con otras veces, o sea que ha sido realmente uh, una, una etapa del sur típica y, y dura. Uh, ¿Cómo navegantes se saben que tienen que comer un promedio de 6.000 calorías al día para mantener la fuerza, la energía y el viaje tardó a Itajaí? Se sabe que en los últimos días tuvieron que racionar la comida. ¿Cómo han hecho para mantener la fuerza para estar en, acá hoy día con nosotros? Bueno, las ganas de acabar nos han mantenido con fuerzas ¿no? para, para, para terminar aquí y con muchas ganas también de llegar aquí a Itajaí, pero... Pero sí que es verdad que hemos estado sin comida durante los últimos días, uh, prácticamente racionando uh, todo al límite y hemos llegado aquí sin absolutamente nada. O sea que, eh, nada, un poco motivación y un poco las ganas también de llegar. Entonces, a saludar el Brasil, Itajaí, Mafre es un equipo muy uh, querido por nosotros. Dile, dile a, nos a algo ahí para la llegada. Sí, bueno, todos teníamos muchas ganas de llegar aquí y, y sabemos que, que vamos a tener una, un, un tiempo maravilloso aquí y uh, vamos a tener un recuerdo inolvidable de Itajaí. Estamos uh, completamente seguros y, y teníamos muchas ganas de, de llegar aquí y venir aquí. Bienvenidos, gracias. gracias. Señoras y señores, un gran aplauso para Mafre, Juan Vila, un navegador. Y Mafre, ahora nos vamos a dar un tiempo ahí para familia. E os amigos, we have a time for family and friends. Well, that was Juan Villa and skipper Xavi Fernandez on board Mafre. And just going out of shot, Phil Lawrence, the race director, just talking to Xavi. With all these things, when the race finishes, there's so much emotion in the air. But of course, the competition goes on. And that is the two boats. That, that is the, the fact that we now have to come to the two boats that are still racing. Uh, getting your head around this, we have just seen this colossal moment, the finish of leg seven. But the challenges are still remaining for two of the teams. Vesta Salemithar Racing, Sun Hunkai Scallywag have retired from leg seven, but they are very much in a race against the clock. Vesta Salemithar Racing got dismasted earlier on, and they pulled into the Falkland Islands, and they had a bit of a mammoth task on their hands to get themselves back underway with enough power to make it into Idijai before the clock ran out so they could still rejoin the competition. Now, they have sent us a little bit of an update here, and we're going to take a look at some of their efforts to rejoin the race and get themselves back onto fighting form to carry on their efforts to win the Volvo Ocean Race. So I'm, I'm here in Itajaí. Charlie and I uh, left the Falklands a few days ago and uh, we came back here to try to coordinate all the logistics of getting the boat um, up here as quickly as we can and uh, prepared in time with the new mast to uh, rejoin the race and restart for the next leg. The, uh, the rest of the team is still in the Falkland Islands and they're preparing the boat uh, for transit here to Itajaí. Uh, they've had to convert the ballast tanks to diesel tanks. They've had to uh, reprovision the boat for a different type of passage, uh, which we hope, best case scenario, to be about 10 to 12 days. They've also been able to secure a, a jury rig on the island, um, 
which will uh, aid in the journey up here and, um, and are getting prepared for the delivery crew to arrive um, hopefully later today to uh, do the handover and, and start making their way north. Yeah, so the guys actually tried to leave the Falkland Islands a few days ago and, uh, and motor toward uh, mainland South America. They ran into some mechanical and technical issues, which were totally separate from the demasting, um, which forced them to return to the Falklands, which, they are, which is where they are currently. Um, and you know, since then, they've been using the time to properly prepare, uh, rig up a jury rig, increase the fuel capacity of the boat, and uh, do everything we can to try to make the trip from the Falklands to Itzajai as, uh, as quick and efficient as possible. It's really been a collective team effort to try to get the boat back here and uh, every little win feels like a small win um, and there's still a lot of things that need to go our way in order for it to all to happen but, um, but we're going to keep pushing and keep fighting and uh, it's all we can do. You know, in our situation, the rig was in multiple pieces. Um, there was a lot of the rig still in the water, uh, thrashing about in a pretty furious sea state. And um, it, you know, we were in jeopardy of basically po poking a hole, a hole in the in the hull of the boat, which would have been, um, you know, a very very grave situation. So, fortunately, we were able to cut everything away and salvage the hull, um, which is what we were able to do. Um, it, it wasn't our first choice, you know, by any means, because we never want to put anything in the ocean. Um, but we set out in this campaign to be the most sustainable team in the race and we're not going to let this incident stop that. Um, you know, we are going to offset our entire carbon footprint and this will be added to that. Um, so we're going to work with 11th Hour specifically to make sure that's the case. So we, we, we know what it is and watch this space for, for how we're going to take care of that. I mean, uh, you know, this has been a really trying time for our team and, and, it, and it kind of has been for a while now. Um, but. Uh, you know, we, we, on behalf of Charlie and I and the whole team, we really appreciate all the support that we've received from our sponsors, from the Bob Ocean Race, uh, friends and family, and, and really all of our fans and supporters around the world. Um, you know, we, this team is an incredible group of people, and, uh, and I think you only really see that when you face adversity, um, and, and we've certainly had a lot of adversity in the last couple of months, and um, the team spirit continues to remain strong. Everybody's still really motivated to get back in the water and try to win this next leg in the Newport and um, you know, put our best foot forward for the rest of the race. Um, so thanks to all of you for continuing to support us, and uh, we look forward to uh, being back in the water and making you proud. Charlie Enright and Mark Tal, co-skippers of Vessus 11th Hour Racing. And we know that they have left the Falkland Islands. It is certainly a long journey ahead of them. And the best way to keep up to date with all their progress is going to be to head over to the team's social media channels. They will be posting regular updates, how the team are getting on as the clock ticks down. And so far, we've been getting a few little pictures as well. This is the jewelry rig that's been going up there. And Conrad, this is a bit of a big effort here. It was a mammoth effort because uh, putting the jury rig together is is more, a lot more complicated than just chopping down a lamppost and sort of sticking it on top of a boat. Um, that uh, what they've had to do there is sort of weld up attachment fittings, uh, prepare the, the the mast base so that it can receive uh, this this fantastically beautiful new jury rig. So hats off to to the team. You've got the sailing team there. You've got some shore team coming uh, to get this together. I think that uh, this can be uh, a real team bonding opportunity that they've had to fight together to, to get this job done. Uh, and again, another uh, example and opportunity to show the resourcefulness that the Volvo Ocean Race requires of all of the teams. And it's not really about the racing here in the Volvo Ocean Race. Yes, there are points out there and there is very much a, a winner for each leg. But for the sailors, it's so much more than that. And for Vesta Salimathar Racing to get themselves back up to the rest of the fleet in Idijaye, and joining the competition again, that's the real test of this team at the moment. And there's another boat as well, Sunhunkai Scallywag. They lost a crew member in the Southern Ocean. John Fisher sadly going overboard and the team were unable to recover him. The boat has made it to Chile and now they are on their way to sail through the Strait of Magellan and then into Itajaí with a delivery crew. And again, the best place to keep up with all those updates, follow the crew's social media channels. They have been keeping us up to date with their progress and all the trials and tribulations that are going. And well, from everybody here on the Daily Show team and the arrivals, we wish them the very best indeed. And we're gonna leave you with an incredibly moving tribute that the team made for John Fisher, the sailor on board that was sadly lost earlier on in this leg.
I suppose just the experience, you know, sailing in the cold day after day, the relentlessness of uh, the weather, um, you know, it's grinding, really grinding, and it, it you know, makes you think long and hard about some of the things you do in your life and your mental state and everything else. And I think highlight and low light is, is that, the weather and the conditions, you know, blasting along at 30 knots is magic, you know. incredibly happy. He, was, he looked incredibly fit, a big smile on his face. He was just enjoying the experience of a lifetime ambition of sailing around the world in the Volvo Ocean Race. Fish was an amazing guy. He was incredibly patient as a teacher. He was really good with the younger people on board the boat. He would teach them how to do things better, how to do things smarter, how to sort of think ahead of the game. He was also a great company. Happy Valley Post Day, baby. With the Marengo. Absolutely. He could talk about sailing, he could talk about anything in the world. And he was also one of the most safety conscious people. He was always thinking about how do we make sure the boat is safer, the crew is safe, the welfare of the people on board. And he was really just the most thorough gentleman I've had the pleasure to sail with. Um, hope everything's going well, mate, and um, hope you have a wonderful time. Happy Valentine's Day to Kirsten, the woman that makes me the man I am. Oh. Supporting me with everything I do. Oh. Uh, thank you very much. I suppose where I grew up and growing up with the love of sailing and watching the Whitbread start, you know, every four years out of the Solent. Um, you know, it's one of those things that you always dream of doing and whether you ever get the chance is, uh, is another thing. You know, if, if you're lucky enough to get the chance to do, uh, do a race like this, everyone should... Uh, grab it I think you know it's not it isn't for everyone but you should always challenge yourself <laughs> 